Paragliding is an amazing sport. The glider itself is both light and simple and can even be carried in a rucksack. Talented pilots can fly all day long and now the longest cross-country flights are approaching an incredible 500 kilometers. We've made this DVD to show how the glider behaves and the pilot should react in some of the most extreme situations you're likely to come up against whilst flying a paraglider. We shot the last instability film in 1992. Uh, a lot of the lessons that were taught in that instability film are still true today, but the gliders have developed quite a lot since then. Well, I think uh, the counter steering on collapses especially got a lot better. Gliders don't surge as much, they don't turn as much on the collapses. So um, today I think the problem is more that people do too much on the brakes than not enough. We have uh, all the equipment we need here to safely test gliders and to demonstrate for the purposes of this film. Each pilot is flying with a, a life jacket. We have a rescue boat. We have a helicopter as well for filming the whole thing from the air. We also have uh, two cameramen on the ground and also a camera on the, on the pilot as well. So hopefully we should get some really good shots to show you exactly what goes right and what goes wrong when you're SRV testing. Uh, Stefan is uh, all ready to go testing over the lake. He's going to be doing uh, radical manoeuvres, so all this has to be done with the best safety precautions possible. That means doing all the tests high, over a lake, in calm conditions, and he's also wearing a life jacket, and he has a harness with two reserves. Uh, let me just show you his one reserve on the right side and the other reserve under the harness on the left side. The asymmetric collapse. This is one of the most important maneuvers in paraglider flying because it happens most frequently and is one of the most common causes of accidents. It's caused by turbulence collapsing one side of the wing and for the purposes of this film we're going to simulate that by pulling on one A riser. Here you can see the pilot is pulling on the right hand A riser with his right hand and collapsing the right hand side of the wing. You then have to control your direction of flight by applying brake on the left hand side. Here the pilot has collapsed the right, he pulls the brake on the left and is pulling the brake quite strongly and is actually managing to turn in the opposite direction away from the collapse. Yeah, I noticed when I was doing the tests just now that normally, you know, 10 centimeters of counter steering is all you need, you know, so. And when, and when somebody puts their, their hand right down to their waist, uh, the glider stalls more easily than when it isn't collapsed. 
In this shot, you can see that the pilot gets a 70% asymmetric collapse. Then he counter steers by applying brake on the left hand side, pulling about 15 centimeters of brake. If you counter steer too much, then the glider might enter a cascade. Here you can see that Stefan also has about 15 centimeters of brake. He applies a bit of brake on the right hand side and the glider reinflates all on its own. There's no need to do any pumping. In this shot, we have an even larger asymmetric collapse, and you can see that the pilot is actually weight shifting in the opposite direction, as well as counter steering, which is also very important. Here the pilot does not counter steer enough, and the glider turns about 90 degrees. And if the collapse doesn't come out, if you just get a little bit of a stuck wing tip, usually um, a little bit of brake on the collapse side will fix that problem. So this lot of um, big pumps like we used to do before or hard pumps like this are not, not really necessary nowadays. You should let the glider just take its own time to come out, but the most important thing is to control the direction of flight rather than to concentrate uh, too much on getting out the collapse. The other thing that's changed a lot is um, pumping out deflations. Nowadays the gliders uh, reinflate on their own and you don't really need to do any pumping. Um, really as soon as, if, if you manage to counter steer the glider, normally the glider is already, already recovered um, before you even have, have realized. Here we have a series of asymmetric collapses and you should study these pictures carefully. Try to get a feeling for the way the glider moves and the way the pilot needs to react in order to fly safely and control his direction of flight. The secret is the amount of brake to use, not using too much and combining it with weight shift. When you get a really large collapse, you need to weight shift. You can see the pilot pushing on his left leg there to maintain left weight shift as he's counter steering to the left at the same time. In this asymmetric collapse, the pilot uses so much weight shift and counter steer that he turns really quite strongly away from the hill on his right. A cravat is the worst kind of collapse, where the sail gets caught in the lines and doesn't come out. We can see in some situations, if you, if you get a cravat, very often the glider doesn't rotate very much for the first five seconds or so, and you have time to put on a little bit of brake, and to control the direction of flight. But if you don't do anything at all, then the glider begins to pick up speed and within 1360 you're into a very severe spiral dive, which is one of the most dangerous things which, uh, which can cause injury nowadays. Again, the pilot has got the wing caught. He needs to control the direction of flight by applying right hand brake strongly. He applies a little right hand brake, but not enough to stop the rotation. Here where pilot is slowing the wing down, looks like he's entering a spin now. The glider dives forward and you have a small cravat on the right hand side. This time the pilot has controlled the direction of flight and the glider recovers on its own. One thing that's very important is uh, not to overreact. I said in the asymmetric collapse that normally 10 centimeters of break is all that is required and if you actually do too much or at the wrong time then you make the problem much much worse. So I would say 80-90% of the time it's better to let the glider fly on its own than to try to interfere with um, the glider's recovery. Yeah. In addition to the brake input and the collapses it also helps a lot to use your body weight. So if your weight shift to the side, which is open, which is still inflated, that should make it not necessary to use the brake at all, at all most of the times. It's very easy even if you get a 50 or 60% collapse, if you weight shift and turn the other direction, it's very easy to uh, even turn really quite sharply away from the collapse. So um, this is a very good safety feature. So it shows you how much brake you can do if you're doing it right. Uh, 
so that you can turn with it without stalling that the wing that's still flying. Here the pilot's doing a full stall. During the recovery, he doesn't put his hands up. This results in an asymmetric dive forward, which causes the pilot to get half a twist. Here you can see him untwisting himself, so he's facing forward again. This pilot has a collapse on the left side, over controls the right hand side, causing the glide to spin and dive. He's going to do the same maneuver again, he gets the asymmetric on the right side, counter steers on the left too much, causing the glider to spin and stall in a cascade of maneuvers. As soon as he puts his hands up, the glider flies off normally. Julian here is doing a series of spins as a result of overreaction. Here you can see the pilot's holding his left brake down, causing the glider to spin. During the recovery it dives forward, so he does a wrongly timed brake manoeuvre, causing the glider to enter a full stall. This pilot gets a front collapse, followed by an asymmetric collapse, which he counter steers. At this point, he's doing well. He applies too much brake on the left now, and enters a spin. Watch how as soon as he puts his hands up, the glider flies off on his own. With this helmet cam view, you can see the loss of pressure on the left side of the wing as the pilot applies too much brake, causing the glider to spin. As soon as he puts his hands up, the glider flies off again nicely. Here we have an asymmetric collapse, nicely counter steered for the moment, then he applies too much brake, and the pilot enters a spin, puts his hands up, the glider surges forward and comes out nicely. Here's Stefan flying left hand brake going to a spin. The spin does not recover whilst he still has a little bit of brake on. You can see he's, he was holding his arms about shoulder level and the glider just carried on spinning. Here we have an asymmetric collapse viewed from the helmet cam over control on the left hand side causes a spin. You can see the loss of pressure on the left hand side of the wing and as soon as you put your arms up it recovers nicely. For the purposes of this film we are inducing the forefront collapse by reaching up with both hands and pulling both A-lines. This collapse is actually induced by turbulence from the helicopter. And looking at the helicopter on the left there, it's just flown above the pilot and he gets a big front collapse. You can see the whole wing disappears and the pilot looks up immediately to check what's happened. And very quickly, within one second, the, the glider reinflates and the pilot starts flying again. Collapses often happen when you least expect it. Don't overreact or panic. Look up and check the problem and then react. We've done quite a few front collapses uh, during this, this test. Um, generally you can see from the front collapses we've done that a front collapse will recover on its own very quickly. Uh, sometimes you can have a deep stall phase during the recovery of a front collapse. Um, in which case it's, it's best to keep your arms up to stop the glider from um, staying in deep stall. But uh, yeah, generally speaking, front collapses recover on, the on their own. Is that always the case for you, Stefan? Well, sometimes I find, on, uh, especially when you're using the speed bar, you're going pretty fast, you get a big frontal. Uh, sometimes the glider sticks, doesn't want to come out by itself. Um, you recognize it that the whole leading edge is um, like collapsed and in that case you just want to put as much brakes as it takes to open the center of the glider. Generally as soon as the center opens you just bring your arms back up and the glider will recover. Pitch control is a very important pilot skill. It's used throughout normal flying as well as SIV testing.
Uh, Stefan, how, how important do you think pitch control is on, on modern gliders? Well, I think pitch control is uh, probably one of the most important things in flying. Because as long as you have a wing above your head, where it should be, it's not before you, it's not behind you, it's going to be quite stable. In addition to that, um, you want to look for the brake pressure. So in turbulent air, you want to put a little bit of brake so you can feel your wing, not too much. Just to have a light pressure on the brakes and you just want to keep it that way. So you lose the pressure, you put more brakes, pressure comes back. Just bring your arm slowly back up. If the pitching movements get very large, you can get a, a collapse. If it's symmetrical, you get a full front collapse. And if, uh, if, if you're slightly asymmetrical or maybe a little bit of turbulence, will cause an asymmetric collapse. And if, if you have the chance, it's a good idea to do uh, SIV training over the water and to do these pitching moments to the extreme where you get the collapse. First of all, the best place to learn is on the ground, just ground handling your glider. You, inflating the, you inflate the glider and bring it up and you can feel when the glider is beginning to overshoot so you can control that with the brakes and what you learn on the ground is exactly the same in the air so every pilot should spend probably as much time as he does in the air just ground handling and it's, it's very easy to do, you don't even need a hill to go to, just a flat field near you. Now if the conditions are calm and you're flying, perhaps you're ridge soaring, a bit bored, it's a very good thing to practice is the feel the pitching movements of your glider and to do that you just uh, face into the wind put a little brake and then release the brake and feel how the glider surges forward and then put a little more brake and then let it release it again and the glider will just surge forward and back and you should play with the brakes and play with the movement the swinging movement of you under the glider and uh, it's a bit like learning to to swing on a child's swing Everything is similar to when you're flying. It's, it's a little more tricky when you're on the ground, but you learn to control the glider in exactly the same way as when you're flying. So you're controlling the pitch of the glider. When the glider rocks back, you have to let the, the brakes up. When the glider rocks forward, then you apply more brake. You even pull the A's a little bit to keep the glider coming forward if it's hanging back and deep stalling. So this is the same as in real flying correcting all the time. Notice that he's always looking at the glider. Even when you're flying, when things are going wrong, it's good to look at the glider, then you look at the horizon to check your attitude and your altitude, and then you look back at the glider. So a lot of the time you're concentrating on the glider, seeing that everything is, is, uh, is right on it. Wingovers involve the use of pitch and roll control at the same time. The pilot needs to swing from left to right and time it so he's in time with the natural motion of the wing. In order to get nice wing overs going, round wing overs, you want to use a lot of weight shift and you want to use the weight shift ahead of the brake input. So if you want to do a wing over to the right hand side, you weight shift right, pull the right brake and for changing the direction, you first change the weight shift and then you change the brake input. 
This is a bad wing over, so it's a, a, a wing over where the pilot is not making the movements in time with the movements of the glider. This causes the lines to go slack and the pilot to fall slightly weightless for part of the time and this is what causes the glider to collapse. So if you keep getting collapses on the outside of your wing um, while you're training wing overs, you need to apply more brake on the side which keeps collapsing um, in addition to the weight shift and the brake input on the inside wing. If um, that doesn't help, you want to see some professionals to tell you what you are doing wrong. There's a nice series of wing overs where the pilot's going over the horizon, over 90 degree wing overs. Swing through landings. This is a technique which combines the pitching skills which we were talking about earlier in order to make a nice landing in very light wind conditions or even tailwind conditions. You're using the pendulum effect of the glider to swing through and actually climb on the last moment just before you touch the ground and to reduce your flying speed to the minimum. Here you can see the hand movements of the pilot. What he does is he slows the glider up and then releases the brake, which causes the glider to pitch forward. And then you have to do it at exactly the right height above the ground so that as it swings through, you climb again a little bit and then you pull both brakes to land. Steering with the D rises. Sometimes there could be a problem with your glider whereby the brakes are not able to be used. Perhaps the knot that attaches the brakes to the brake handles comes undone and you can't use the brakes to steer anymore. But fortunately with modern gliders you can use the D-riser to be able to control your direction of flight so you can fly down and make a normal landing. This pilot's flying a competition glider and he's using all the techniques we've talked about to be able to control the glider properly. This is known as active piloting. So the pilot is using the pressure, the feeling of the pressure going down through the brake lines. He's controlling the pitching of the glider, he's controlling the weight shift and here this is Bruce flying at Saint Vincent and you can see the movement of the chest straps on the harness which shows you the, the way the pilot is weight shifting. Big ears is a descent technique often used to increase the sync rate of the glider, although it doesn't increase the sync rate as much as beelining or spiral dives. Big ears should be used with caution and should never be used close to the ground. You shouldn't use big ears close to the ground because in certain situations you can enter a deep saw. Uh, very often when you're entering ground effect this can cause the glider to enter deep stall and you'll be surprised that you suddenly fall into the ground from around 10 meters high and many people have had back injuries from using big ears close to the ground. To do a beeline stall you reach up and grab your bee risers and then you start pulling them down which is quite hard to do, there's a lot of pressure on them and to exit the beeline stall you release the bee risers and also have your hands above your head so you don't slow the glider down. In normal flying your sync rate would be around 
one, one and a half meters per second. And in beelining, a mild beeline would be three or four meters per second, and you can go up to eight meters a second if you really pull the bees very hard. You can see the difference in sink rate when the pilot on the left-hand side pulled the beelines. It's possible to enter a deep stall after the beeline stall. You recognize that when you look up, the glider is not fully inflated, and the brakes feel funny and mushy. So if that happens, you want to grab your air risers and push them forward until you yeah, feel the airflow again. Now in this beeline stall and the exit, the pilot will try to dump the dive. And as you will see, the glider starts to stall. So trying to dump the dive on exit of beeline stalls is dangerous. Now here, Bruce will show you how to do the exit of the beeline stall correctly. You will see that he doesn't apply any brake on the exit and the glider picks up speed immediately and starts flying again. A spiral dive is a useful descent technique. You may need it to get down quickly. Perhaps there may be a dangerous situations such as gust front or uh, some other reason where you need to get down quickly. To do a spiral dive, you simply uh, apply brake on one on say the right hand side in this situation and you right weight shift at the same time and you try to enter the spiral in a controlled fashion so you do not do it too abruptly but you need to enter a spiral over a period of around 1 360 you should be careful not to do a spin and the way to avoid that is to apply a brake enter the 360 and make sure you do enough weight shift in the same direction so as to smoothly enter the spiral and not stall the wing by applying too much brake. Once you've established yourself in the spiral, you need to recover by putting your hands up and also removing any weight shift you have in. People often forget that they need to stop weight shifting when they want to come out of the spiral and this can cause the glider to continue to turn. As you can see in this picture, uh, the pilot is not only applying brake on the inside, he's also applying a little bit of brake on the outside. Um, that's in order to uh, well, change the sink rate, so if you want to go full speed, you have just only the inside brake pulled. If you want to get slower, you apply some brake on the outside as well. That also solves the problem of um, uh, stable spiral so if you find yourself in the spiral your hands are up and your weight shift is neutral and the glider just continues to go you want to apply some brake on the outside until if you feel that the wing slows down you slowly get out of the spiral and in order to stop your pendulum once you exit the spiral you can also again weight shift and apply brake towards the inside of the spiral. So if you were going left hand, you want to weight shift left hand and pull some left hand brake um, to slowly get out of the spiral. So the pitch control on the exit of the spiral is essential. If you get the pitch control wrong as you come out from a spiral, spiral you can end up with a collapse, a front collapse or an asymmetric collapse. Here's a smooth entry into a spiral dive. Pilot is applying right weight shift and his right hand brake. Goes into quite a fast spiral. There he releases and the glider pitches back as it exits the spiral and then pitches forward again afterwards. Full stall should only be done by experienced pilots during safety training sessions over the water. As you can see it's quite a violent maneuver and it's also quite a dangerous maneuver because if you release the full stall at the wrong time the glider can dive forward so far that the pilot can even fall into the sail. 
Stefan takes one wrap in each hand and then applies both brakes. At that moment, when the glider surges back behind you, it's very easy to release the brakes, and this is absolutely the wrong thing to do. This is what causes pilots to fall in the sail. So what happens is when you pull the brakes down, you must lock your arms down so that they don't get pulled back up again when the sail falls behind you. On the exit, as you see in this example, you need to release the brakes all the way, otherwise the wing doesn't really have a chance to start flying again. Even if you only hold the brakes down 10 or 20 centimeters, it can be enough to stop the wing from flying again. Here we see a pilot who releases the brakes exactly at the wrong time and nearly falls into the sail. So he's applying the brake, the glider falls behind him, he releases the brakes, and there he just misses the sail. It's an extremely violent shock that the pilot has, and it pulls the reserve out. Luckily, the pilot is uninjured and is doing a tra safety training course anyway, so he just falls on the leg. Spins are always pilot induced. They're caused by the pilot putting too much brake on one side of the wing. This causes one side to stall whilst the other side keeps flying. So the glider spins around with the flying wing flying around the stalled wing. Here Stefan is applying right hand brake. As you can see, it's quite violent because the wing is stalled and there's a lot of pitching and rotation, so the pilot very easily gets disorientated. Fortunately, recovery from a spin is very simple. You just put your hands up. So when you come out of a spin, you might get a collapse so all you have to do is cope with the collapse in the normal way. So counter steer the turn and just pump out the deflation. This pilot is having to throw his reserve after getting a big cravat on the glider, which causes a spiral dive. There are different reasons you need to throw your reserve. The most common is a collapse quite close to the ground and you can't control the rotation as you see in this one. Um, also sometimes if you get collisions between two pilots and you get stuck in the lines, um, there's no way out. You need to deploy as soon and as fast as you can. This pilot is pulling in his main canopy to stop it getting tangled up in the reserve. If you don't control the main, then the, the main canopy can actually uh, stop the reserve from flying and get tangled in it. Now this pilot here pulls the bee lines down. You see that the reserve and uh, the main par paraglider, they both act as a to slow down the pilot and they don't interfere with each other. So beelining after reserve deployment is uh, probably the easiest way to prevent any problems. Here yeah, they're uh, flying tandem. They get completely wrapped up in the glider. This reserve is quite unstable as well, which is not ideal and they're very lucky not to land on that yacht. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this film. It gives you a feel of 
what things the pilot should be doing correctly and how the glider reacts if you make the right movements and also we try to show what happens if you if you do the wrong actions as well and the likely reactions of the glider in all these situations learn something about becoming a better pilot. We wish you many happy flying hours from all the team at Airwave.